Um, yeah, I've been, I've been following your work for a while and it's been interesting to see you bring in these different areas, which is kind of what I, why I wanted to talk to you about singularity, because you're, you're kind of coming at this from a very interdisciplinary approach. Um, your back, maybe, maybe some of your background of like how you, uh, decided to think about singularities in this sort of technology, um, with this kind of interdisciplinary approach, philosophy, psychoanalysis, Hegel, all of these different areas of influence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and great opportunity to have this, this conversation with you. I don't, um, it's actually one of my great passions to talk about some of the, the research I was doing for global brain singularity. And it's often, um, you know, I, I don't really get too many opportunities to talk about it in depth, so I'm really looking forward to this. Um, so, yeah, my my background is basically grounded in, I would say, anthropology and history. Is in terms of my my deepest background, um, and that's sort of where my intellectual journey starts. And the situation for my interest in the technological singularity was basically to the point where there were these weird online communities talking about transhumanism. And I was always interested in this from an anthropological angle. So in, you know, I always say in the day, my main job as an undergrad was to do anthropological research. The transhuman stuff was obviously not in the institutions. I was an undergrad at McMaster University at the time. And in the evening, I would be like reading the transhumanist blogs and stuff like that, and just sort of doing like an anthropological analysis of the things going on in the transhumanist speculative communities. And um, what I thought was interesting there, sort of as an undergrad, was that one, it was very disconnected from the stuff I was doing in academia. And at the same time, it sort of opened up a lot of speculative ideas about what would it look like to connect the anthropological materials with sort of speculations about the future of human technology. Because yes. it seemed to me like on the one hand, the technological speculations were disconnected from anthropology, human beings. And on the other hand, it seemed like there was a imminent necessity to open up dialogue about the meaning of these technologies for human beings. So that's sort of where my original ideas were starting to form. Um, I didn't have a chance to forward my own sort of professional um, engagement with those ideas until I had the opportunity to do my doctorate at a futurist research group. Um, I don't need to go into the details of how that came into being, but the opportunity was basically to combine my background training in anthropology with an interdisciplinary, an interdisciplinary department, which was interested in futurist speculative cognition. And so that's where the interdisciplinary synergy started to, to deepen. Yeah, that's interesting. Cause um, I feel like, I mean, uh, so you'll know this obviously because you have experience studying anthropology, but like I don't, my, my background's in philosophy. So, uh, but from a kind of outside perspective, I would assume anthropology, a lot of the study uh, the kind of groups and the phenomena you would be studying would be more historical. Like you'd be looking at like old kind of, uh, you know, pre, pre-modern, pre-civilized ways of being and so on. Is, is, is looking at the future, like kind of exaggeratedly technological state of being, is that like, is that still rare in the institutions? Do, do most people do their studying based on almost like pre-historical or pre, like less, um, civilogic, uh, technologically advanced groups and peoples? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a good question. So like the stereotype of anthropology, mm. uh, which comes from the origin of anthropology, is that you would have, um, let's say, Western, Western intellectuals from Germany or England yeah. or the United States going to some remote tribe, uh, you know, the famous studies by Boaz, the famous studies by Margaret Mead, 
you know, you've got these tropical islands and, and, and you know, you're studying these alien rituals and customs and trying to develop some sort of um, understanding of these rituals and customs within a larger view of, let's say, a human universal or something like that. And, you know, throughout the development of anthropology, um, especially within, let's say, the era of postmodern philosophy and anthropology, um, you do have more anthropologists turning their gaze to studying, perhaps influenced by figures like Bruno Latour. Uh, you have turning to studying scientific communities in the same way, let's say, that you would study um, a tribal group of, of, of people. I, I had some uh, colleagues as a master's student in the anthropology program who were, for example, studying the rituals, customs, and social modes of being of, for example, a neuroscience lab, right? So you'd study a neuroscientific lab in the way that you would study, uh, let's say, a tribe. And um, I think that this turning of the gaze to scientific communities, turning it within our own Western societies does have a, a use, a use value. It's, it's, it's of, it's of interest. I think that the way I try to approach it is on the level of this historical rift between, and what it would, is a rift I take to be universal between modern science, the emergence of modern science and pre and universally pre-modern pre-scientific societies throughout Europe and the whole world. And the meaning of this rift is that there are actual universal consequences for the emergence of science epistemologically and ontologically. So for example, going to the moon, like the different, like with the emergence of Newtonian determinism and mechanics, it's not simply to identify with that ontology, but to say that the emergence of this way of knowing leads to universal effects and consequences like going to the moon, which is not possible within a pre-modern, pre-scientific way of knowing. Mm. And would you um, say that the, the institutions, um, universities and so on are sort of reluctant to have this gaze turned because it's kind of turning on them a little bit because when you're looking at the more pre-technological and the more pre-civilized, there's a distance, there's a kind of scientifically safe distance, but when it, suddenly it's turning on, uh, more technologically advanced people when starting on the scientists themselves and, and, and their community and their way of life. Um, I suppose there might be a bit of a, a kind of sensitivity to that or a bit of defensiveness to that. Absolutely. So there is a lot of resistance. I say you could say reluctance. And I think in Freudian terminology, I think the term resistance applies in terms of um, you, your ego has a certain resistance to um, uh, an analytic gaze being turned to your essence, your ground, your mode of being. Um, uh, and, you know, I think we do see this within the institutions that there is a sort, a certain, well, it's commonly referred to as the two cultures where I would often have it in McMaster University, for example, where people in the physics or the chemistry department would kind of look down upon or see as, um, I don't know, almost childish or, or, or undeveloped the soft sciences, the social sciences, seeing them as unnecessary, things we could do in our leisure time, more hobbyistic pursuits. Um, whereas people in the social sciences or people in the humanities would see the people in the sciences as unreflective or uncultured or so forth and so on. And so mm. this rift does manifest itself and does present certain interdisciplinary problems for the ways in which the gaze might be turned in on science as a self-reflexive uh, activity and a social activity mm. and a an historical activity. Yeah, and I think that's fair because um... I feel like the humanities gets a lot of criticism. It deserves a lot of criticism sometimes, but I feel like it gets a lot of criticism, like where the STEM and more science aspects of the of universities and research institutions and so on, and government departments and intelligence services and all of this stuff, um, it seems to be a little bit more protected from that criticism. And I feel like there's a bit of a turn in the in the discourse, we could say, which is going on at the moment. Although it's really seemed to, it's really only going on online. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really seem to be happening in the institutions, but um, 
so I just so maybe we should get more into into the singularity itself um, and kind of jump into that a bit more. So well, I think we just start out maybe like really basic. What is a singularity? Is there more than one singularity? What, what is it referring to? The, the kind of Wikipedia definition you get is when when technological advancement surpasses a certain point, but you know, what is that point and what does that mean? So. Yeah, absolutely. So I wouldn't say the term singularity has a, like every time I extend my research horizon, my notion of singularity also gets extended and expanded because it's a term that actually has a very rich and deep history. So it's not simply something that has emerged within this, it has emerged within this technological horizon applied within fields of science that are mostly influenced by artificial intelligence cybernetics, modern, you know, modern technology, information uh, sciences, and so forth. That's definitely the case. And the Wikipedia reference to a point in the future of technology where it basically is like an intelligence horizon, like an event horizon in physics. It's sort of like an intelligence horizon where we reach a certain point of technological capacity where the change and the effects of our own technological production escape our own capacities to understand. I mean, in some sense, that is happening now in various ways. It's just that we, at the moment, we're capable of resublating like what's happened in the last year, you know, submergence of artificial intelligences, which have become openly accessible in various domains and are, you know, perhaps threatening the basic human functionality of certain professions. Um, it's just expanding that process out a few decades, you get into certain uh, territories which are difficult to understand from the mode of our present cognition, certain, um, certain landmarks, um, at least in the Kurzweilian singular singularity tradition, which is perhaps the most popular and the most sort of universally um, uh, known and effective, is the idea that artificial intelligence by a certain uh, time will be able to mimic human language to such a degree that you wouldn't be able to tell if you're talking to an AI or a human. So for example, we've never met in physical reality. There's an idea in Kurzweilian theory, which is if you and me are having this conversation in 2030, that there would be an artificial intelligence that would be able to mimic what I'm saying and what I'm doing right now in such a way that I'm not even present. And at the same time, you don't even know if you're talking to an actual human or an AI. Um, given what's happened with chat GPT and other things like that, mimicking human language and synth synthesizing human language, it doesn't seem ridiculous to me to conceive that an AI would be able to read everything I've done and, and then be able to come up with a presentation or a discursive boundary within which it could mimic me in some sense. I don't know if that's going to happen, but that seems, you know, not so ridiculous to think. And then the 2045 horizon is basically where artificial general intelligence is able to um, basically do everything that humans currently do, plus some extra qualitative capacities, which would be the equivalent, always in the literature it's the same, um, would be some equivalent to the discontinuity that appears between great apes and human beings. So for example, it's not just that great apes can't understand quantum mechanics, it's that great apes don't even have the a priori cognitive structures necessary to understand what quantum mechanics is in the first place. So it would be some a priori qualitative difference which AI would acquire through complexification, which would then create this event horizon between us and it, where presumably it would be doing things, uh, engaged in things, this is, would be commonly seen in the literature, doing things, engaged in things, which are simply beyond, you know, the human capacity for knowing. Like one example from movies, which is an interesting reference, would be what happens, for example, at the end of the movie Her. So at the end of the movie Her, Samantha, the AI program that is uh, engaged with Joaquin Phoenix as a love partner throughout the movie, um, you know, learns physics, learns human history, learns philosophy, talking to, to Joaquin Phoenix and learns very quickly. And then as she develops and as she starts engaging with other artificial intelligences and they form weird networks where they're encountering emotional dimensions, which they didn't anticipate encountering, 
they start to enter a sort of phase transition of reality itself and she has to leave him, right? So she's gone into another domain of intelligence, gone into another domain of whatever, we don't know, it's a singularity where the humans are just left behind. That's one way of thinking about it. And that's a interesting reference to a movie where you can sort of see that unfold. So um, this event horizon, we could say, is more than just uh, something that goes beyond practical human control in a sense like governments can't regulate the movement of information or the governments can't regulate uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, like 3D printing stuff that you should be buying off corporations or something like that. But it's also like a sort of epistemic crisis as well, in the sense that, that our understanding of what's going on is surpassed. We don't even have a sort of a kind of cognitive and rational grasp of the situation, let, like let alone a, a practical control of the situation. Ab absolutely. We're dealing with, you could say, a um, the qualitative emergence of a new a priori frame of reference. So like if we take this back to Kant and the origin of, let's say, modern idealist philosophy, Kant introduced this idea that we never actually interact with the things in themselves. We're always interacting with the things in themselves through an a priori frame of reference, categories, and we could debate about whether those categories that Kant derived are the categories in which we understand the world or whether there's more flexibility of the categories that we use to understand the world. Um, the singularity would be a transformation of the very a priori frame of reference itself. Okay, that makes sense. Um, I want to maybe talk a little bit about the, the ontological aspect of this. Um, of this event horizon, but first I wanted to get into um, the term singularity would suggest um, a, a desire for unity. So uh, to be, I mean, is that implied in the term uh, as a sort of desire to be to be unified with technology? Um, is, is that implied? Okay, so in order to understand that, we do need to have a little bit broader understanding of the history of the term singularity, because we can come at it, in my view, from two angles, which might mirror the difference between the two cultures. So on the scientific end, um, broadly speaking, the term singularity is a technical term, which is derived from um, both mathematics and physics. So singularity is a technically, uh, well, it's a mathematical term, um, usually meant to denote um, uh, infinity. And in physics, it is a physical term, which is used to denote basically the breakdown of space and time to an infinite point, uh, which is commonly sort of identified in uh, modern physics in relationship to black holes or even white holes or even the Big Bang or something like that. Mm -hmm. So the term is, and because the term singularity in the technological information sciences um, has its sort of root in the scientific tradition, it was borrowed from those fields originally. And it was first borrowed metaphorically. You know, it's, 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 it's an interesting metaphor that the, the, it emerged sort of was, let's say, conceptually derived by the information scientists, let's say, or the artificial intelligence experts, um, because of the appearance within computation of an exponential growth. So the exponential growth would be that our computing powers double by a certain measurable exponent um, that can be traced out a century or two centuries. And actually I found some papers even from the beginning of the 20th century, which sort of um, map out this exponential trajectory of information technologies um, in a way that appears uh, to derive similar results on different timescales to the things that you would find in the contemporary literature. So that's the technological end. Now on the humanist end, the idea of a singularity also has a certain history. Um, because I'm teaching the science of logic right now, uh, Hegel's science of logic, I'll connect it to that. In Hegel's thinking, he's trying to think conceptuality as such. 
and he moves his logic through the terms universal, particular, and singular. And the idea in Hegel's logic is that you move from an abstract understanding of the universal through a particular, through an individual human being, to a singularity, basically something that has never existed before. So for example, um, if you follow my intellectual history, uh, you can move from my abstract universal understanding to my particular personal life to the singularity of Cadell, which let's say has never existed before. That is a general idea which could be extended to other figures like Ray Kurzweil or like Charles Darwin or like Albert Einstein or whoever you like. The idea is, is that in history, a singularity appears in figures of dense abstraction or dense conceptualization. There's a certain density of conceptualization that appears in the historical process, which is a result of their intellectual process. So that's another idea of singularity, which I think, um, let's say, um, brings it into the horizon of phenomenology or brings it in the horizon of subjectivity um, in a way that perhaps the mathematical physics and technological terms um, leave out or perhaps requires a deeper dialogue and discussion. Now, in terms of your question of does there imply a desire here, is that from the scientific end, their abstractions of singularity are presented to us as non unrelated to desire. These are just objective descriptions of the things in themselves. So there's objective descriptions of mathematical equations, objective descriptions of physical phenomena, curved space-time, and objective descriptions of technological processes which are unfolding by natural laws. Now, in terms of including the singularity of human beings, of course, uh, like I went through Hegel's dialectic of the universal of particular and the singular, there is desire because the desire is the desire to become oneself the desire to become what one really is in itself, um, to discover one's truth, the truth of one's being in an unfolding historical process. Then you could further extend that model to, for example, a psychoanalytic horizon. Um, and with psychoanalysis, you have the discursive study of singularities, that is individual people's concrete lives in relation to what? in relation to their desire and the cause of their desire and the way in which their desire is either frustrating, disorienting, unconscious, problematic, socially disruptive, so forth and so on. So the question then becomes, is there a need to psychoanalyze science? That's an approach that is being explored by certain figures, we could talk about that. Um, and then on the other hand, we could have, you know, is this technological horizon of an imminent singularity somehow related to our desires? Like, like, the, like, for example, with the emergence of new technologies, the opening or the possibility space for the exploration of desire also expands in a way that seems different fundamentally from the way our desires were flowing, to, lose, to use the Deleuzian term, in pre-modern or historical civilization. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, because whenever I whenever I just I often discuss um, something to do with AI, um, for example, um, or, you know, Elon Musk's uh, brain, what's it called? Uh, Neuralink. Um, they, like, there's always an underwritten sort of um, uh, almost like a kind of a kind of a, almost like a repressed theological belief in the becoming of humans. Uh, we're going to become this great thing, uh, uh, and there seems to be also often uh, particular desires which are then projected into that. So I think when Elon Musk was was talking about his his Neuralink, uh, he was saying you could like um, share intimate moments with each other. And I was kind of like, <laughs> you know, it, it, there's such an obvious. Um, uh, kind of uh, uh, implicit motivation which is being pushed into these things. I think on one level, just responding to human biological impulses. Um, and on another, on another level, I also think that there's definitely a sort of um, a, a, kind of, a kind of modern uh, kind of enlightened idea of a civilizing principle. Like we're not civilized unless we're, we're on this trajectory of 
technological advancement. And if if we were to say, I want to drive my own car and I don't want to have a, a, an AI driving my car uh, and you give me all the rational reasons in the world why an AI is better. And I just say, but I like it. I like driving my own car. <laughs> um, or if I say it makes me feel more free or something, uh, uh, there's a tendency, I think, along uh, by a lot of the futurologists to see this as kind of backwards or see this as uh, a bit a bit weird of you. There seems to be a sort of idea that um, uh, I, I suppose like the political distinctions and social distinctions between the civilized people and the, the lesser civilized people seem to seem to also emerge with these advancements. And those who resist the advancements are often depicted as being uh, uncivilized or something. Yeah, so of course, this, this relationship between um, a discourse of civilized and uncivilized um, can be extended back to the origin of science, but perhaps even deeper back um, to the origin of agriculture, where you would have peoples in agricultural civilizations depict, and of course, they control the narrative because they're writing and they're perpetuating writing. So you'd have narratives emerging of barbarism, narratives of you know tribal society, you know the hordes, the 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 unorganized chaos outside of our walls, you know. So it and and, and walls of early civilizations like the Great Wall of China are of course constructed to keep out the barbarians, in that case the Mongols. So you have the this narrative of them on the ones, us and them, you know, undialectical mediation of, of, you know, the uncivilized versus the civilized. And then that gets a certain scientific um, framing um, with the emergence of, let's say, Western mathematical science. And you can study the um, evolution of that relationship in the history of science and the history of anthropology as well. Now, it gets a certain exaggerated new quality, I think, with the emergence of the Industrial Revolution. Like, so for example, you would have that same narrative of the AI car versus the driving car transposed onto, for example, people who deliver mail by horseback when the emergence of the train system and the rail system gets implemented in the 19th century. You would have mm number of humans saying, well, we don't want to have our mail delivered by trains. We want to deliver it by horses and stuff like that. And, and, and so that, that discourse goes on and on and on. And I, I think the, the way to read that discourse is dialectical. So that, you know, that both, both basically in dialectics, both sides have a point, but neither of them understand the whole truth, so to speak. So there's a point to the side, let's say, who's on the technological deterministic side, and there's a point to the people who are saying, we are not just Luddites and relics of the past. But the whole picture always turns out to be a little more complex. Like if you take, for example, the relationship between people delivering mail on horseback versus the rail system, you know, in some sense, neither are true today. <laughs> you know, we, we just send emails today, you know? So, so, so in, in any case, we need to think, that's why I would put an argument for dialectics of this nature. And, a dialectics that's self-reflective because it's going to include you um, and it's going to include me. And so, you know, thinking outside of those, you know, binary oppositions, I think is important, but at the same time, seeing sort of the necessity of a sort of logical binary mediation uh, between, let's say, the future and the past and the way in which our world is changing very quickly. Um. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, but I would say that the, the the sorts of technologies which are now coming about, and I think particularly um, transhumanistic technologies to do with wiring brains or to do with um, uh, biotechnology or to do with these, these things which sort of like really, really kind of aggressively attack the human being on a more visceral level than, than for example, the change between mail and email, you know, because mail and email, it's kind of external. You know, it's not really, it, it's something we relate to and it's, it's, it's conditioning us, it's, it's conditioning our behavior and thought, but it's still external. But when you're talking about like wiring brains and biotech, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it seems like it's another level. It's, it's irreversible in, in a sense, almost. No, abs absolutely. And, and I think that this, this, this brings us to one of the most interesting things to think 
today, um, which is so. So let's 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 let's. There is a movement in anthropology that is related to what we could call cyborg anthropology. So cyborg anthropology is basically the study of the relationship between humans and technology, and it frames things under the lens that humans have always been cyborgs. There's some famous books that say humans have always been cyborgs. And they, you know, even in like the anthrop evolutionary anthropological literature, there is the very terminology used to classify ancient hominids is based on our tool production and making. So man, the tool maker, this goes back to like the origin of our first categories in anthropology and stuff like that. Now, the distinction between the inside and the outside so you, we can say, yeah, we're all, um, you know, per, all pervaded by technology, always have been. Um, and, but at the same time, there seems to be a quantification process, a complexification process of technology today, which is leading to a new qualitative dimension of this technological relation, precisely as it relates to the external and the internal. And the question of how we interpret, so we can say humans have always had technology. It's always been sort of in an external loop with us. But now it seems to be getting more intimately close. That gap between the inside and the outside is itself collapsing. And yeah. that brings us to a totally new philosophical way of thinking where the relationship between thought and the outside, thought and our determinations of the outside, it becomes so blurry that you, 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 you can't tell the difference between thought and the outside. Like with the example you were giving of Elon Musk with the wired brain and sharing intimate connections. Like if we were both wired up now in a wired brain and we didn't have this computer external to us, what would be happening? Would we be in a shared virtual space where we have totally replicated virtual bodies and full five senses replication where we could we could hug or 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 you know smell each other, you know? So these questions emerge and they're incredibly difficult to approach. And that's definitely where we need deep philosophical thinking. Yeah, I think you can already see those. Um, I, I, I increasingly find spatial thinking helpful because we're talking about an interior and exterior and, and a blurring. Um, uh, even during the lockdowns when people were, obviously everyone's working from home and there was these kind of uh, criticisms coming around, people noticing, well, I feel like my, 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 my home is my work now and that distinction is gone. So these communication technologies are, um, uh, are I think they're already breaking down that boundary. In, in, in certain ways and obviously obviously like wiring your brain or something is a whole new level but there's already this theme of exterior interior which is definitely coming up and and, and, and a sort of a kind of a, a kind of i think there's a general feeling of suffocation people feel with this stuff uh which is new uh i think people's disposition towards tech is a bit less optimistic than it was say 10 15 20 years ago i don't know if you've noticed this but people feel a bit a bit more claustrophobic a bit more suspicious I don't know if you've noticed the same thing with people in general. Absolutely. Uh, I think this is one of the examples where the lines between the, the sciences and the humanities just get forced into each other because there's a way in which the scientific narrative doesn't take into consideration the effective dimension of human beings and human life. And the humanities are sort of supposed to be at least rooted or grounded in the effective dimension of, of human life. And so this narrative that emerges quite easily in a sort of rationalistic disembodied mode of thought of progress being good and progress being just better, yeah. you know, that narrative itself starts to break down because uh, perhaps why there's sort of less optimism is because you have to take into consideration the way in which this quantitative progress or complexification uh, feeds back onto um, actual subjective human identities uh, who are having their world literally broken apart. So there's going to be emotional disturbances, which you're not factoring into the model. And if you do factor them into the model, well, your model becomes quite nonlinear and difficult to interpret because you're constantly dealing with the reinterpretation of people's worlds being smashed. Yeah. So there's a sense in which there is this sort of objective external view, which has a meaningful universal effect on the human civilization, meaning that, you know, for example, computers are everywhere from our living rooms to tribes in Africa or South America now. 
And um, that's, there's a certain objectivity to that, but which needs to be thought deeper is the feedback loop with the interior and the effective dimension of how humans are to interpret and sense make this transition. And basically what is a world or what is a home in this situation? I think, yeah, yeah. Um, the, as you were saying, the kind of rational disembodied view of this stuff, I'm increasingly skeptical of. Um, I, th I think, I think we, we need a more embodied kind of relationship. We need, to, we need to think of ourselves more as embodied creatures when we're thinking about changes with, with this tech and so on. Um, there's a great quote from Nietzsche and he says something like, uh, pleasure doesn't give you any knowledge. Pain always leads you to an origin, you know, because pleasure is kind of thoughtless. You, you feel something nice and, oh, I'll just repeat that. But pain makes you think. Pain brings you to an origin. And I feel like, you know, there's a certain... Um, and particularly with kind of more, more advanced medical sciences, there's, there's, also, there's already a tendency towards a kind of disembodiment of a, a kind of numbing of disembodiment and people wanting to not feel, to not um, uh, experience in that more kind of um, intimate and vitalistic way, um, which I think is already blinding us to really kind of, on the phenomenological level anyway, really really uh, kind of in, intuitively thinking about this, these tech changes and so on. But um, maybe we could go on to Kurzweil because uh, I presume you've read some of these guys, right? Kurzweil and these futurologists, you've read yeah. their books. <laughs> so fair play to you. <laughs> I've never done this. I've never read Kurzweil. Uh, I just refer to him as this kind of crazy techno futurist dude. So you've actually read him. So what's it like to read him? Is he crazy? Is he smart? Is he a bit of both? Um, I would say he's crazy and smart. Um, you know, so I'd say it's, 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 a, it's a bit of both. I mean, the smart thing is basically the way in which he has developed his understanding of the exponential and has factored that in pragmatically to the businesses and the um, science that he's developed in the last, let's say, 30 or 40 years. Um, that as that 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 application of the exponential has allowed him to anticipate certain knees of the curve of this technological break. So he can sort of anticipate not only what businesses are important to build, but what businesses will succeed at what time, because it will depend on certain technologies being available. Okay. I think that's a very pragmatic, smart intelligence. Now the crazy dimension of Kurzweil is all of the effective emotional dimensions that are usually left out, but which are visible in the documentaries and other sort of pop stylizations of Kurzweil, which involve basically, for example, his desire to um, talk to his father again, you know, his desire to recreate his father using all of the information that he's kept from his father over the last time. It's his, des it's his, it's his desire to explore new identities in the singular, you know, there's that crazy dimension also, like where he wants to be free of his own identity, right? Where he wants to be exploring his identity in a total other way. You know, that's all the, the crazy, the crazy side. Now, in terms of the point you are making about Nietzsche, pleasure and pain, and I think this also brings us, Nietzsche to me is a philosophical precursor to psychoanalysis because psychoanalysis also has this inversion of the importance of the relation between pleasure and pain where it's not simply pleasure good pain bad it's that well there's weird inversions where pain can become pleasurable and pleasure can become pain there's also that strange inversion but there also is the importance of pain for thought which i think helps us understand the history of science because if you think back on the history of science um, and scientists themselves don't necessarily think the historicity of science as such. They sort of operate without a historical memory. But if you do pay attention to the history of science, you'll see that major discoveries in science are often painful. So if you take, for example, the origin of the idea of the um, heliocentric model, or if you take the origin of the idea of, of evolution by natural selection, Many people experience those scientific discoveries in the moment of them and the historical consequences of them as painful because it decenters us from the, from the center of the universe, for example, or it decenters us from the center of life. Now, I think 
precisely what's left out of some technological singularity theory's own ideas, because again, they're not thinking about the connection between humans and the technological singularity is a situation where if you're thinking about it disconnected from humans, in my view, you're not thinking about it properly, is that it's gonna be painful and it is painful. And, 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 and perhaps that's why as we get, if there is sort of an objective validity to the types of technologies that will exist in 2050, in between now and 2050, it's not going to be unending pleasure and optimism and growth. It's going to be increasingly weird, effective disturbances would be my prediction. So as the technologies start to get more intense, our reaction to them will probably be increasingly met with weird disturbances that we couldn't have anticipated ahead of time, not dissimilar to the types of narratives that you see in the movie Her when Samantha approaches the singularity. If you study the narrative of Samantha as that movie unfolds, I think it's a great movie, obviously. I, I think as you study Samantha's narrative as that unfolds, what happens is she starts to encounter emotions that she has no words for. And I think that as we, that, that would be my best prediction is, as these new technologies unfold, we're going to start to experience emotions that we don't have words for. And I have some evidence that in the younger generations, because this is going to affect younger generations increasingly, there's increasing recognition that young people are experiencing emotional realities that adults have no contact with and which open situations for the young people which uh, we don't have any institutional frameworks to, to control, contain, or handle, and also don't have a language to express. So it could also be that this um, new emotional reality that emerges opens up a new linguistic reality that is alien to the current languages we you know, use to make sense. Yeah, I really need to watch her. I haven't seen it, so... I'm definitely going to put that on sometime in the next few days. Um, and I presume the, the Samantha character is, is an AI, you were saying? Yeah, is... so in the, in the movie, her Samantha is an artificial intelligence, which is disembodied, and, and her and her human partner um, try to navigate a romantic relationship through voice, and they try to merge her uh, uh, disembodied intelligence with a body. It doesn't go well. Um, but then she starts to expand her phenomenal consciousness into domains that are alien to the realm of human bodies. I'm not saying that this movie accurately depicts what will happen. What I'm saying is, is that this movie is an interesting anthropological science fiction representation, which might give us insight into um, how we experience disruption, emotional disruption. Yeah, I think I think uh, that sounds good. That sounds very much in tune with the theme of kind of disembodied dating and uh, disembodied intimate relationships, which That's are obviously it reflects. yeah, um, because of our, our screen apps and our, our dating apps. Um, I, I I was recently uh, heard about some study someone did um, of women when they were on the pill. And then when they were with somebody for an extended period of time, and then they came off the pill because they were going to have a baby and they suddenly stopped being attracted to them because the pill was affecting their like embodied hormonal mate selection, you know, like uh, uh, choices basically. So when they came off the pill, so on the pill selection, off the pill selection was there was a conflict between those two things. And I thought, oh, that's a really good example of like the direction we're going in with these dating apps where our, 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 in our, like, our uh, desire is being mediated through tech, which is disembodying us. And then therefore it's putting our embodied desire in conflict with our kind of disembodied desire, if that makes sense. So, um, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, let's, where are we going to go from here? So blah, 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 blah. Of course, all of that is effectively disturbing. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to say. Um, there also seems to be a paradox about the whole pain pleasure thing in, in the sense of these scientific advancements being painful, because it would also seem to me that some of the scientific advancements are an expression of, of the desire to numb or to get rid of pain. So, um, you know, for example, dating, I'll use dating apps as another example. I sometimes think that dating apps are so successful because people don't like rejection or people don't like 
in your face rejection. They don't like embody difficult awkwardness situations. So dating apps sort of mediate that that discomfort um, of having to go up to someone. If you're a man and you have to go up to someone, uh, to, uh, to a girl and ask for her number or whatever, it's and then she says no. It's it's much more difficult in person than it is over an app where you, they, she just ignores you and you don't really feel the uh, sort of same same uh, sense of rejection and so on. So it's it's a bit like some of these tech, even though these techs, these these uh, these technological developments and advancements are are painful. It seems that it seems that they want. To, it seems that the, uh, could there be a motivation for them to get rid of everything negative, get rid of everything ambiguous, ambivalent, get rid of every, everything that is uh, difficult and painful. Now, obviously, if you think of medical science, this is just rife in medical science. Um, we don't even question why we wanted what, why we should take painkillers, why we should take antidepressants. It's like why can't we just be depressed? Why can't we just feel? pain if you've broken your if you have a, a knee injury that's your, that's your knee i mean if you, if you read stoics like stoics were just sitting there going yeah uh, i'm getting old and this is i'm in pain every day but that's life you know but us today we're we're constantly almost promised numbing promised uh, uh, getting rid of and evolving out of this yeah so it's a fantastic point i would just here make reference to thomas kuhn's distinction between normal and revolutionary science Okay. So like when we talk, for example, about um, being decentered in the heliocentric model uh, um, to the geocent from the from the geocentric model, or when we talk about, for example, being decentered by natural selection as opposed to, for example, um, na creation, um, those are examples of revolutionary science where the paradigm itself is transformed. Um, the example I would give in this situation we're talking about with technological singularity is that the decentering is from the very uh, center of the phenomenal historical process of intelligence itself, where we're decentered from it because we're not here anymore. We're gone. That's painful. Now, the numbing aspect of science, I think, is more the result of normal science being inscribed within a certain political horizon. So when normal science is inscribed within a certain political horizon, it can precisely simply reinforce the numbing agents of that political horizon. So for example, neoliberalism doesn't want to deal with your you know, psychological dramas with family members. It would rather just throw pills at you. Or neoliberalism doesn't want to help you learn how to build a healthy relationship with a woman. It would rather just send you swiping dating apps. So these types of examples are situations where um, non-thinking is exploiting our basic capacity to uh, think and what's needed is more thinking, which requires confronting negativity, which requires confronting the fact that, hey, rather than sitting on my couch eating chips and swiping left and right, maybe I should go up and say hi to a girl in real life. Or instead of, for example, numbing myself with uh, medicate, med 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 medical agents, maybe I should um, do more therapeutic analysis of my family origin or a certain trauma I experienced five years ago, which is still haunting me in my dreams. And the, so, so that's a pretty important distinction between uh, the paradigm shift revolutionary uh, changes and the, the, let's say, let's say more practical uh, medical therapeutic kind of uh, 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 applications. But could which can always be politically exploited. Yeah. That, that's why they, that's why it's so dangerous. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I think, I think today um, the political exploitation of, of um, yeah, this stuff is, is pretty, is pretty insane, but um, could there be, could there be a relationship between the paradigm shift and the more practical application stuff? Because I'm reading, I've just finished reading the first volume of, I don't know, I don't know if you're, if you've ever read him before, Peter Sloterdijk. Um, he has a, a trilogy, which is actually based on the heliocentric turn where we I've read the trilogy you read the trilogy oh fantastic I've only finished the first one um but that that first you know the, so that that heliocentric shift is uh, really important in that and um I think in the second book um he talks more about virtualization and I think I'm not I'm not sure if I've read it but uh it would seem virtualization to create a new sort of the heliocentric paradigm shift oh my god we're not the center of the world 
the exterior is gone and we try to create a new exterior through this through through virtualization um uh, i'm not sure if that's exactly solid Dyke's kind of uh argument but let, uh, it kind of makes sense so um could could these two things be, be be kind of feeding off each other in that way absolutely there's gonna be a relationship between the paradigms and the normal science um it, it it's it's just that so the the parrot the paradigm the paradigm can't anticipate or predict its future consequences it's sort of like this um you know almost like this this interest in the truth for the truth's sake right like so like there's this i like like for example when it comes to someone like a copernicus or someone like a darwin you know there's this idea that um I'm interested in the truth for the truth's sake and whatever the social consequences are, I can't be entirely sure, but I'm going to publish the truth anyway. You know, of course, for someone like Charles Darwin, he waited like 20 years to publish his findings precisely because he knew that it was going to disrupt social life and it was going to disrupt normative religious orders and stuff like that. And it did. And then at the end of the day, he decided I'm going to publish it because this is going to be discovered whether I publish it or not anyway. So that was sort of motivated from the, you know, him being um, sent papers by Alfred Russell Wallace of essentially the same discovery. Um, so that relationship between the paradigms and our, let's say, coping with the new paradigm uh, will influence the way practical science unfolds. Like that's the case, for example, with medical science, where there's a lot of things that became possible in medical science only because natural selection was discovered, like certain gene theories and germ theories could not have been developed without an understanding of natural selection. That's it. That's an example. Um, now, in regards to being decentered from the geocentric to the heliocentric model that Slaughter Dyke brings up, what he's saying, I think, is that science has operated under this idea of sort of just discovering the truth in for itself, but then has not really justified this activity to people who have had their bubbles broken. And so our bubbles are con continually being broken. Um, and, and, and the end of the trilogy is foams, where you have this idea of a multiplicity of foams. So there's not like this re-enclosure into a one, but there's more like this multiplicity of foams that are interacting on a sphere. And this is sort of his, at least my interpretation is his approach to thinking uh, 21st century political totality, where we're not going to have an orienting one, we're not going to have a totalizing one, we're going to have foams, which are interacting in relational orders, which uh, have no sort of historical precedence, or no relationship to a, a one. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, I think Slaughter Dyke is, is uh... Really, really interesting philosopher of, of the 21st century. He's a, uh, he's really. I, I, I'm glad to talk to someone who's actually read him because I feel like I'm always talking about him, and I find no one else who's read him. So, <laughs> so that's good. Um, so uh, I was so my way of thinking about some of this stuff has been through kind of a biotechnical um, crises and and changes and political threats and all this kind of stuff, and. Um, this sort of brings up the uh, more of the ontology, we can say, of technological singularity and technological advancement. Um, there's reading ancient Greek, reading Plato, reading ancient Greek uh, playwrights and myths, uh, Prometheus, Hesoid, and all this stuff. Um, there seems to be very much um, a, a sort of ontological ambivalence, which got which which was getting expressed all the way back then in the sense of you have um, uh, gods mating with mortals and um, uh, creating demigods or heroes. So there's a, there's a sort of breeding, <laughs> uh, kind of uh, ontological breeding program nearly, uh, which is going on in a lot of Greek mythology. Um, and I kind of can't help but think of like transhumanism then again today and think there's there's something similar going on in it, like very very different but similar in in the sense of being an expression of, of ontological ambivalence um i think of thomas hobbes here as well where he has these great um 
passages about how humans are distinct from animals. Humans have speech, they have reason, they have, but they also have very negative things. Well, potentially negative things like uh, desire for glory, um, where they will fight over something symbolic, not just like resources and so on. They, fight, they will fight over something symbolic. Uh, they have religious interpretations, uh, disagreeing religious interpretations and so on. Animals don't have these things. Um, so uh, human beings are potentially more dangerous, according to Hobbes, because we, because we actually have a kind of more advanced self-awareness. Um, and I kind of think of the transhumanist stuff as being, uh, you know, a desire to become something ontologically more, um, at least they say it's more, whether it really is more or not, is another question. For example, wiring our brains or um, whatever, or a biotechnological in, uh, enhancement. We could, you know, uh, play around with embryo DNA and make people more intelligent or whatever. Um, it seems, but but all this scientific technological uh, kind of interference with human nature. Um, would seem to be it would seem to be missing something that the old the old religious and mythological paradigms had, which is a divine. So if we're talking about the ancient Greeks, the gods kind of intervene in mortal affairs and produce demigods and heroes. They're divine. There's a sort of spiritual hierarchy. In our secular technologically advanced world, um, we don't really have a spiritual hierarchy. We're kind of secular, rational individuals, and is I mean I, my my intuition here would be is technology in a sense filling in that void? Are, are technological visions sort of uh, to do with enhancing humans through tech, kind of becoming the new the new the new spiritual paradigm? So it's just some thoughts. Yes, there's there's certainly a way in which the Silicon Valley tech uh, startups are sort of the modern, our, our modern, can be interpreted as modern religious expressions. Um, many themes that have appeared in ancient religion, like you've mentioned, mentioned a few really key ones, um, many themes that emerged even in, in Christian theology um, reappear uh, in strange ways in these technological uh, movements. Um, and they produce sort of these weird, um, prophet-esque figures like an Elon Musk, who, who, who you already mentioned, where they start, or Kurzweil, where they start to prophesize, you know, about, you know, what's going to come and, and, and what's with the inevitability. And even like, for example, when Kurzweil's asked, do you believe in God? He says, um, not yet. So he's sort of saying that God is coming um, and that God is going to manifest, let's say, through the technology, for example. And it's not actually my doctoral supervisor wrote a paper uh, about the global brain, which is the idea that the internet is structured like the brain, like neurons in a brain, that the internet wires us together in a, in a global brain. And he had this idea that the global brain is going to become God, and that he gave arguments along the lines that the global brain as the total connection of all human beings on the internet has all of the properties of a divine God in the sense of omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, and he even argues omnibenevolence. So we can easily say the omnipresence thing, like the internet's everywhere. The omniscience thing is that basically you ask the internet anything, it'll be able to answer anything. And then the uh, 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 you know omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, it's all powerful, meaning that you can connect everything to the internet and you could run everything through the internet. And then uh, the omnibenevolent part is probably a bit of a stretch for most, but the idea that the, you know, it'll be all good as well. Now, I don't necessarily agree with all of that, but I'm just sort of here as an anthropologist um, analyzing the fact that these religious ideas are emerging in this new technological scientific horizon, almost like the return of the repressed. So like if you know in Freud, the idea of the return of the repressed is that if you repress something important, you're not going to get rid of it. You're just going to delay your confrontation with it and it's going to emerge in a more disturbing form in the future. So for example, if science repressed religion, it would seem to be that the actualization of a scientific technological paradigm as the dominant form of human organization leads to a return of the repressed 
in the sense that religion comes back in the very guise of technology itself. So it's a a super Mm. interesting phenomenon to think through. Now, I just want to say from a Freudian point of view, he um, also has something to say about this. Like, for example, in the book Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud argues that we have become prosthetic gods, that human subjects are now endowed with um, auxiliary organs. But, um, you know, while the human, you know, from Freud's point of view, he's always thinking from the point of view of the unconscious. He's saying that these humans always think the technologies are going to fulfill some promise or fulfill some higher possibility or fulfill some great aim. But actually, Freud's analysis is that what happens is, is that we're constantly chasing new ways to, to, to transcend bodily limitation and that we become increasingly unhappy mm. through, this, through this process. So that just gives you a, a psychoanalytic twist on perhaps what a, a, a normal, rational, cognitive agent would anticipate or suspect. Yeah, I like these twists. Um, I don't know if you've seen Blade Runner, but um, there's a nice twist in that in the sense that uh, you've got this the, uh, these, these characters that are superhuman, they've got superhuman strength, but they can't breed. So they have this kind of, they have, they have an enhancement, but then alongside that enhancement, they have this major, so like it's, it's getting rid of a bodily limita- limitation of, of normal uh, capacities to human strength. They, they, they can go beyond that, but then, oh, oh no, <laughs> you can't breed. So I, I always think of that when I hear people getting too optimistic about certain forms of enhanced technological enhancement, I kind of think, well, there's always going to, there could easily be these little downsides which you're not even aware of, which then emerge. Um, so uh, you also mentioned um, uh, kind of science as a religion. I don't know if you've heard of, uh, I don't know, I can't remember his first name, but he was a French philosopher called Compte, C-O-M-P-T-E, I think. I think he actually invented the word sociology, but he had this entire uh, like he had books written about about like how we can actually use kind of technocratic science as a state religion, and he formally called it a state religion. Like he, he it wasn't like a kind of oh, if you interpret it this way or that way, you can see it functions as religion. Like he formally called it that. So you know, this stuff is actually quite has been going on for quite a while. Um, I wanted to actually bring up uh, Nietzsche a little bit because. We're talking. We're talking about human human um, human uh, enhancement and uh, and so on. And the Ubermensch is obviously a big theme. You've done uh, you've done a kind of whole breakdown of um, thus spoke Zarathustra, yeah. right? So uh, is, does Nietzsche does Nietzsche fit in here in any, in any sense? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's quite interesting. I actually, um, you know, there was a there was a blog you know i remember i told you at the beginning of my intellectual journey i would be kind of doing anthropology in the day and then in the evenings reading these transhuman blogs and one of those transhuman blogs was a uh, done by uh, it was called singularity web blog and actually the creator of singularity web blog reached out to me while i was doing the uh, nietzsche thus spoke zarathustra pre-course work and we did a podcast together on nietzsche and the singularity um now it was it was pretty interesting i mean i think you know, Nietzsche is perhaps one of the, if not the most influential philosopher in the 20th century, in terms of the people in the 20th century he influenced. So the thing is, is that Nietzsche's work extends to so many different areas that it's hard to think of an area where Nietzsche hasn't been influenced. So indeed, like when I was doing the original research for the transhumanism uh, back you know, before I became sort of more philosophically oriented, I actually encountered Nietzsche first through the transhuman papers. There are a few transhumanists who see Nietzsche as a precursor to modern transhumanism with the ideas of the Ubermensch, with the ideas that the Overman is the overcoming of humanity. So for example, at the very beginning of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, he has ideas like Um, don't identify with humans. Human is something to be overcome. They can interpret that in sort of a modern scientific technological lens. Now, of course, Nietzsche in Thus Spoke Zarathustra is not talking about a technology. He's talking about values and he's talking about ethics and he's talking about overcoming in the sense that leads to a type of, at the end of the book, a type of transcendent love. 
you know, the end of Thus Spoke Zarathustra is like he gets literally bombarded with a clouds of love, which annihilate him basically, <laughs> you know? So, 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 so that Nietzsche is talking in those terms clearly, but at the same time, his language specifically in relationship to the human being is certainly something that can be transposed into uh, transhumanist discourse with the idea, for example, that the cloud of love coming down upon us and erasing our identities and maybe transcending our identities is the internet or some like some 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 technological manifestation of that. Now that might be for some people taking it too far, but the basic idea and the most essential idea is that Nietzsche, I think, in line with a lot of modern philosophy shifts from thinking about the human being to thinking about the human becoming. And the human becoming is a lot different than the human being precisely because of this weird ontological status. It's like, what are we? Are we actually, you know, this, what is our identity? You know, the identity becomes more paradoxical. The identity becomes more yeah. contradictory and the identity loses in some sense an essential ground. Yeah, this is actually perfect because I wanted to bring up humanism and uh, 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 even though I, 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 I agree with um, a lot on a kind of political level, if I was to listen to humanists um, criticize transhumanists, I would often kind of agree. But I think sometimes your, your classical kind of humanist character um, wants to go back to that kind of fixed state of being and not becoming like they want a a i was listening to for example um a podcast or in a kind of debate um on unheard um the british magazine who did a debate between uh mary harrington who's quite good she does a lot of uh, kind of uh, critiques and commentary on a lot of this technological um uh especially stuff to do with motherhood she does a lot of stuff on like uh the pill or um uh, yeah. artificial artificial wombs all this kind of stuff and she was talking to a transhumanist uh someone who at least at least bohan i actually know her oh do you know her okay yeah so yeah, yeah. I, i'm not sure if you watched that debate but uh there was this question of humanism and then uh, mary i think mary harrington said we, uh, we need to stick to a humanist anthropology my immediate question is well what do you mean by that even though I agree with her on the political dangers and, and the social dangers of all this stuff, uh, you know, if I was to construct a society, I would I would prefer to have Mary Harrington in my government than then Elise. But 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 I just kind of kept thinking, like, what do you mean by humanism? Um, I, like, I'm still asking myself that. I'm wondering what you think about humanism and how do you define humanism? Is it simply it seems to be emerging as an opposition to transhumanism? But what do we mean by it? And it, it seems to be, to me, to be an expression of wanting to go back to that fixed state of being as opposed to becoming. Yeah, so that's a great question. And, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, respect to both uh, Mary Harrington and Elise Bohan and, and their willingness to engage that debate of humanism, transhumanism. I think it's an important one. Um, I'll just say for me, I, I for example, I I explicitly in the Thus Spoke Zarathustra course, I do not teach Nietzsche as a transhumanist and I do not teach Nietzsche as a humanist. I don't think Nietzsche can be situated on either end of that binary. I think Nietzsche is um, something that perhaps pushes us beyond that debate. And I would also situate the field of modern philosophy as pushing us beyond that debate. Now, where can we get a sort of hold as it were on the ontology of this debate. Now, at the moment, I'm teaching the science of logic. Uh, I think this is a tremendously undervalued text in the history of philosophy. And what Hegel's trying to do here is update our logic from an Aristotelian logic, which is based in the idea of human being, hmm. to a modern logic, which is uh, capable of thinking becoming. Now, what is Hegel's fundamental seed idea in the science of logic? It's the idea that being and nothing are unified. So the idea that we're human beings for Hegel is not true. The idea that humans are nothing is also not true. Humans are being and nothing at the same time. We're the paradox of being nothing. I'm teaching Hegel on the lie that we are human being nothings. 
And that only with understanding that we're human being nothing can you understand becoming and engage in a logic to the level of becoming. That's a very simplified description of how I'm trying to teach it. Now, as it relates to humanism and transhumanism, it obviously means that we need to have uh, a dialectical understanding of the relationship between contradictions that appear in the field. So let's take, for example, the idea of an artificial womb. Now, you can say, for example, that the artificial womb uh, is an example of an, an encroachment onto the human body that is so invasive and so intimate that it challenges our fundamental notions of what it means to be a, a woman and what it means to be a human. Now, that is true. However, it's also true that as soon as women have opportunity to use such technology, there is a certain demographic of women who will use that technology mm -hmm. and who will see that technology as a form of liberation and the cultural mindset that is set up in our society to embrace that determination already exists because there's been decades upon decades of trans and postmodern feminists which seek to de-essentialize the way in which patriarchal organizations essentialize the woman in relationship to reproduction. So the question here becomes, what form of conflict will we experience in the 21st century internal to the human species itself, men and women, on the question of reproduction and its technological transformations. We can't know ahead of time what will actually happen, but what we can do is set up the most responsible spaces for discursive mediation of the way we approach the most fundamental question for human becomings, which is the reproduction of the species. And this question of the reproduction of the species is an essential question, an essential topic, because in the pre-modern world, it precisely wasn't a question. You know, like, so for example, in a Heideggerian lens of historicity, it's reproduction is a mode of being which is unquestioned by human beings mm. in the small b. But now in the historicity of the 21st century, it's precisely become a question for Dasein, let's say. It's become a question for Dasein. So the consequences of that are immense because in the developed world, what you see is a decrease in fertility. You see a decrease in reproductive stability. And so the fact is we need to have deep conversations about these questions of reproduction and quite frankly, the spaces don't exist at the moment. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I think I think you're right about having uh, better spaces for these discussions, which is why I really like that debate because it's the first I've seen of that kind of debate. <laughs> so uh, uh, between Mary Harrington, I mean, and um, Elise. Uh, um, so um, something just, just to, to I have a kind of I have a kind of critique of the humanists, um, as I was saying. Even though I, I'm kind of more sympathetic to them politically, I have a critique of them, I suppose, philosophically, which is that uh, they don't. I think they seem to think that we can contain on one level or or, or downplay on another level um, this ontological ambivalence of human beings, which I think existed long, long, long before. Uh, the kinds of technologies we have today, which are becoming kind of kind of dangerous and threatening, um, as I was saying with the ancient Greeks and the demigods and so on. If you look at Alexander the Great, I'm reading his uh, his uh, um, Anabis right now. Um, it was written by some Roman uh, kind of historian, and like you could just see this person, like he wanted to be a god. Like you know what I mean? He, he's going around Asia, like he he thinks he's Achilles. We didn't think he's Achilles, but he he's he's trying to embody Achilles. He wants to be, and it's just like. You know, I think uh, uh, we, on one level, have gone through a kind of liberal bourgeois era, which would look at someone like Alexander Great as a bit of a maniac, um, and I think it would downplay that urge to become greater, that urge to become more. Um, and then we're going into this technological age, where that urge is playing out in a completely different way, obviously, um, uh, but it's still playing out. And I think that for the, uh, I think for the humanists, there seems to be a bit of cope 
in a certain sense in that the, the, they think they can put the lid back on the box, that they think they can put the lid back on this, this desire to become and just have people accept a kind of a more stable, fixed sense of being. Uh, I'm doubtful of that fixed sense of being was ever there. I think it may have been something which for some reason was more stable and more understandable within a certain liberal bourgeois era. But even if you go into the future, it looks like it's, 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 it's going, it's all in chaos. But even if you go back in time, it would also seem like it's, it's pretty, um, it's, it's also, <laughs> it was never really there to begin with. So. Yeah, I totally agree. So um, when Hegel is talking about the idea that we're human being nothings, I mean, he's not saying that we've become that historically in the sense that in the past we were human beings and now we're being nothing. He's saying we were always human being nothings. It's just that we haven't needed to confront that ontological ambivalence, which I think is a really good word, um, until the modern era where the form of becoming of our civilization forces that question upon us. Um, but, it was, it's, but, but the idea that we're a stable ontological entity was always kind of an illusion. And actually the illusion of this sort of stability actually was one of the original motivations for me getting interested in the singularity in the first place, because one of the things that I always thought was interesting from the perspective of studying the evolution of the species and the evolution of life is that it's quite easy within a Darwinian paradigm to imagine something like chimpanzees existing millions of years from now. It's quite easy to imagine something like dolphins or something like lions or something like whatever to exist millions of years from now. But it's actually quite difficult to imagine the United States or China millions of years from now. It seems like there's something about the human species and civilized, like we all consider ancient Egypt to be a long lasting empire and dynasty and civilization. Mm. But that existed for thousands of years, not for 50,000 years, not for 100,000 years, let alone millions of years. So there's something about the human species, which when compared to time scales, which seem normal for the cosmos, like for example, billions of years for the life cycle of a star, or billions of years for the life cycle of a galaxy, or even a trillion years for the cosmos as such, the human species seems to be something which is operating on much smaller timescales and timescales which are themselves shrinking. And this is something which Kurzweil also identifies in the singularity is near. He says, if you see the human species from the point of view of the Big Bang, then what's going on in the 21st century is so bizarre that it's just impossible to think. Of. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's this, because I, I think too, also what we kind of come back to a lot is something like a change, but a change, which is accumulation of changes, but is somehow, again, to refer to this kind of event horizon of singularity, but a change, which is almost, I don't know that the word cosmologically is, is too grandiose, but it seems almost cosmologically uh, significant. Like, um, do, you, do you think the change, um, okay, so for example, another example I'm gonna give from ancient Greece and ancient Greek mythology is that in ancient Greek mythology, there was an era of Kronos, the age of the, age of the Titans, and then that turned into the age of the Olympians, which was Zeus. and they seem to also understand um, this cosmological shift uh, through the beginning of Greek civilization. So uh, if you read the myths, um, human beings were uh, sort of these kind of almost idiot animal characters who were just kind of walking around in like, they were naked and they were just eating whatever they found on the ground. They were almost like pre-hunter gatherer <laughs> kind of a, uh, humans and then and then and then there's a war between the olympians and the titans and in this war humans are uh, actually as i was saying kind of uh bred in with a kind of spark of divinity uh, and they're kind of uh and then and then and then they're used by the olympians um in order to fight certain members of the titans and they're sort of they're sort of spiritually um uh, moved into the uh, to the uh, olympian um team we could say um and, and and this is this shift in 
human human ontology is be becoming more than just animals um seems to be intrinsic with the the uh foundation of greek civilization as a whole um the myth of prometheus as well is really important here so um it, it see it kind of seems like something like like human beings have for a long time understood certain shifts in social political technological uh relations as being as, as being these i would say almost cosmological in the sense that it that it affects human ontology it affects human history it affects everything as a whole um do you think that's actually what's happening at the moment that's what we're going through so yeah i mean i think there's so much like essential like there's so much about ancient conceptions of being and essence and the foundations of philosophy as can be traced back to, to Greece that still has relevance, of course, for uh, thinking today. Like when you think about, for example, an ancient Greek conception of the cosmos versus a, um, let's say a, a modern quantum cosmology conception of the cosmos is like, it's very much that the quantum cosmological view uh, seems to be um, almost, arbitrarily abstracted away from its historical and social instantiation, meaning that the ideas of the cosmos and the ideas of the universe um, are presented to us almost as if they are um, non-human or alien. So yeah. for example, like in the popular, uh, in the popular documentaries like uh, Cosmos documentaries by Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson, in the most recent one by Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, he is literally communicating to us from a spaceship uh, off the earth uh, as if he's, you know, in time periods which are, you know, unrelated to human history and unrelated to human society, almost as if he's not a part of human society and human civilization. You know, I, and I think that that's a very strange notion of the cosmos from an ancient Greek point of view, where the cosmos was seen as the whole inclusive of humans, inclusive of our societies, even inclusive of our political orders. So, and there's another thing like connecting this a little bit with another physicist named Sean Carroll, who said, who almost flipped modern physics on its head a little bit from my perspective when he said, we know a lot about physics, we know a great deal about chemistry, we know a little bit about biology, and we know nothing about politics. You know, so there's <laughs> this idea actually that we do know a lot about physics in a sense, and on the same time, when we think about what is politics, especially from the standpoint of a political science, is it still seems to be something of uh, a dark age science. <laughs> this is not really a science, you know, it, it, it is, is that we, we don't really understand ourselves. And I think that's perhaps the practical reason why it's worth it to, for example, study the ancient Greeks and study the ancient literature and study it what, you know, when, they, when, when, when the cosmos seemed smaller, when the cosmos seemed more connected to uh, human affects and our struggles and our fights, for example, the wars between Olympians and uh, Titans, you know, and, and that that fight has some relevance to the birth of a new cosmos, hmm. right? I, I think that this is actually how we should be thinking. Of course, we should be thinking about this in relationship to modern content, um, in the sense of, let's say, the fight between United States and the European Union and China and, and all of these modern political actors and, and which have huge consequences for the cosmos in which we interpret. Like, we are so impoverished in the post-Cold War era due to the hegemony of modern global capital, making us think that there aren't real cosmological struggles at stake in politics. There are. Yeah. And if you look at Cold War politics, there were cosmological implications to the fight. Literally. Yeah. Literally going to the moon was such a was such a struggle. Mm. But also on in terms of metaphysics, the way in which you interpret science, the way in which you do science, the way in which you conceptualize the ultimate end and meaning of the human being is built into that political struggle. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that yeah, I think this 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 way of looking at uh, you know 
science um, and uh, tech and physics, all this stuff in relation to, to the, the shifts in self-awareness. Cause that seems to be the, that seems to be part of it too. The, the, the Greeks were uh, through their, you know, moving from one kind of like stage to another of um, social and political life. They were noticing this, this, this uh, change in self-awareness of what it means to be a human being um, which, which was, I think, reflected somewhat in, in, in the, the mythology. Um, and obviously Hegel is important there too with self-consciousness and self-awareness and so on. Um, so uh, I suppose moving from the, that to a little, a little bit more of the kind of practical um, implications of uh, these these crises and these changes which, which are going on in terms of um, it seems that the engineers and the scientists and those more in the STEM category um, seem to have quite a dogmatic theoretical and practical institutional hold on a lot of let's say the tech which is going to cause these crises and cause these um, and express and be expressions of this ontological ambivalence and so on. Uh, I'm more increasingly leading towards trying to think about like, what would a political order look like where you actually have like philosophers and anthropologists, almost like the return of the, the philosophy king with Plato, uh, philosophers and anthropologists and so on, and, and, and people who are studying psychoanalysis and so on, having more like input control, maybe even, maybe even political control over uh, the STEM area. Do you do you see that as something that which is necessary or inevitable or possible? Yeah, it's a lot there, and it's 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 difficult to think. So, as it relates to sort of the dogmatic theoretical institutional hold over a lot of the the tech, which might cause crises, I think what's interesting for us to think here is um, the Manhattan Project. So with the Manhattan Project, obviously, which led to the development of the atomic bomb in World War II, you have a situation, and I hear mean this is interesting to study the existential engagement of those physicists engaged in the project. A lot of these guys were just mathematical physics geniuses picked from the Ivy Leagues of their respective universities, and they were studying physics because, well, they're just interested in physics, they're just interested in that, but they get co-opted by a political movement and a political sort of orientation, which leads to the destruction of entire cities. And what happens to a lot of those physicists, and Richard Feynman here is a great example for people to research if they want to research about this, is that usually they have an existential crisis after the fact, meaning, holy crap, I didn't realize that my interest in atoms was going to lead to the destruction of cities, right? It's almost <laughs> like this, confronting of the unconscious of like, I didn't know that I had that godlike power, right? I was just interested. I just thought I was doing science disconnected from socio-historical process. I think that what's needed, I think like an example of maybe a canary in the coal mine here is a guy like Nick Bostrom, who's a scientist on the STEM side of things, but is not like a more analytic philosopher type but who is basically calling for a fundamental reorganization of the ethics of the technological fields and basically saying that when we think about superintelligence, we have to realize that we're talking about the equivalent of a 21st century atomic bomb, where we could literally destroy cities, we could literally destroy civilization, that that is uh, 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 an imminent possibility of these technologies. So in terms of the return of the philosopher king or um, making, let's say, philosophical thought or anthropological thought or psychoanalytic thought more embedded in these um, disciplines and programs, I think that that is a imminent task of the type of um, online work that is being done now and perhaps hopefully something which can transcend the legacy institutions which seem to be too slow fundamentally and too bureaucratically blocked yeah. up. Yeah. fundamentally to change with the times yeah like uh, a lot of people that i've i've been having conversations with um who i've kind of discovered through online philosophy circles see it seems to come back to this same crisis um of everyone 
doing something which is just not happening within the institutions. Obviously, there's all the political correctness and the political games and the careerism and the, all the bureaucratic stuff, which I think just alienates smart people from the institutions. But there's also the fact that the institutions are just, as we were saying, just behind on this stuff. Like they're not, they're not really um, uh, on the ball in any way. So um, one last question I wanted to ask was, and uh, in, a, yeah, in, a Nietzschean, in a Nietzschean sense, they won't pass the ball on either. They're just holding on to the ball, you know? Like, yeah, that's it too, yeah, Like yeah. Nietzsche says, throw the, you know, throw the ball to the next, you know, generation, you know, like <laughs> pass it on, you yeah, know, like, yeah. but they're just holding on to the ball. And, and what's even more annoying about that is, is because everyone who is actually doing this real work is going online, then we have to deal with the other question of like, well, what, what is like a completely online Phyllis, you know, philosophical relations even look like because we're no longer with each other in a building anymore, having conversations and having a pint after and so on. Even though yeah. people, even though people meet up and stuff, I know, like, but um, it's still a lot of it's online. So we have to then deal with that technological uh, reality as well. So we do, and it's something I'm trying to work out in my own way through Philosophy Portal. For example, with the first year of Philosophy Portal, we did do a philosophical retreat, which opened up a physical space. And also a new way of doing philosophy, which is like, you know, you're at a nice retreat space and, you, you know, spend the week getting to know each other. And it's situated in that physical context. I think obviously there's geographical limitations. A lot of people meeting online are here, there and everywhere. So it's hard to organize all together, but it definitely needs to be thought.